Another edition of Eye on the Issues. Today we are talking with Nathan Winters. He is the president of the Wyoming Family Alliance, and we're talking primarily education. Nathan, thanks for taking the time to talk to us about this. Let's begin by, why don't you paint a little bit of a picture as to your background when it comes to education? Certainly. Well, a lot of this started my awareness of education, especially in the state of Wyoming. I'm a graduate here of a, of a private, ed, private education in the city of Cheyenne. Then, of course, I went off to college, uh, uh, graduated with my first master's degree out in, in uh, uh, California, then made my way back to the state, to the town of Thermopolis, where I lived for 13 years. And then I was both a pastor there and in the Wyoming legislature uh, from uh, the city of uh, Thermopolis. My legislative district was a little larger than the state of Connecticut. Uh, just there are more antelope than people per square mile, but it's a beautiful part of the world. And I love those people very much, miss them very much. We have since moved back down here to Cheyenne as we have founded the Wyoming Family Alliance, which has really uh, taken off in an extraordinary way as we've been able to give voice to people from across the state on issues of life, religious freedom, family values, education, freedom, and parental rights. And so uh, that's just my life in a nutshell. There's a lot of other aspects, of course, as you would imagine, but that's me in a nutshell. Fantastic. Let's let's begin, if you don't mind, by giving us a little bit of a history of how public public education, how the system of public education began in the United States. You kind of just let's start with that as a as a base. Yes, there's a lot of different ways to look into this. I, I really appreciate uh, the work of of several people, but Dr. Joel Spring, uh, very specifically uh, from the University of Richmond, has spent a lifetime studying this out. And uh, I think the first edition of his book on the history of American education uh, comes from about 30 or more years ago at this particular point. Uh, and then also another, Dr. Thomas Kidd uh, has written quite a bit on, on this subject as well, just in American history, but uh, both of them kind of come to the same conclusion. In the mid 19th century, uh, education in, in America was spotty and uh, non-compulsory. Uh, we kind of know that uh, a great illustration of that would have been the life of Abraham Lincoln, who once declared that he had, had never more than about uh, six weeks of education uh, in his life. But he was very well educated. And one can see that with uh, probably the most famous piece of American prose ever written. The Gettysburg Address is really just a co condensation and a, a beautiful distillation of the funeral oration of Pericles. And so you can see that these are well-educated people, but they didn't have formal education as we know it today. And so some of that began to change. Of course, we had Noah Webster's Blueback Speller uh, that was written in the late uh, uh, 1700s. And then the McGuffey's readers began to really pick up in, uh, starting about mid-1830s. And, and so that began to really change a lot of things. There was excellent education going on. There's still no true public education sent, uh, uh, as we know it today, for sure. Uh, there were already advocates for that. Thomas Jefferson was an early advocate of public education, or at least offering that for parents. But we begin to see a change about 1836 with um, Horace Mann. Horace Mann uh, began the what was called common school movement. And uh, what was meant by that, and I'm borrowing something from uh, Dr. Kidd on this subject, but he said that this would be a state-supported school that used the same curriculum and textbooks and employed teachers trained in state-run schools, and that they would teach ethics and morality based on common assumptions. And so that had a lot of credibility, especially as there was a, a, a lot of people moving into the country. But it began to become a way of fencing other ideas out. And during the mid-1800s, late 1800s, that wasn't so much of an issue until you see the rise of a gentleman uh, by the name of John Dewey. And John Dewey uh, became what is known today as the father of modern public education. Uh, Dewey, though, was specifically trying to slant public education into something that he desired it to be. And one of the first things that he tried to lay an ax to the root of was the whole idea of ethics. And I'm borrowing this from Dr. Joel Spring in his book. 
One of Dewey's early educational experiments took place involving a high school ethics class where Dewey wanted the students to view ethics in relation to real problems rather than abstract principles. It sounds good on his face until one asks, okay, what did he consider to be principles that were abstract? And Dewey believed that ideas, values, and social institutions originate in material circumstances. It was a different version of the same materialism, if you will, that we recognize from folks like Karl Marx and others, but uh, uh, that it, it basically he believed that they originate in the material circumstances of the human life, and he rejected any notion that there was a divine origin or a kind of ideal that could underlay any sort of value. And he laid this out specifically, and I would challenge your listeners and readers uh, to, to pay attention to this. This was something that he really uh, uh, put together in a very small booklet called A Common Faith. And he tries very hard. To, basically, he makes this statement in the book Common Faith, and I think it really uh, synthesizes his idea. He said this, there is no God, there is no soul. Hence, there's no need for the props of traditional religion. And then he makes the statement, I think this is dangerous. With dogma and creed excluded then, immutable truth is dead and buried. There is no room for fixed and natural law or permanent moral absolutes. So you begin to see baked in, and this is in about the 1920s, uh, you can see that there is a whole shift among some of the elites in the public education system. Now, let me just step back for a second and say this. I know a number of really good people involved in public education. Uh, my wife is, a, is an educator. Uh, I know of some wonderful people, especially back in the town where I, uh, I lived for a number of years in the town of Thermopolis, people I absolutely adore involved in public education. I'm just saying that there is something that shifted in the system. Now, it's it ripples throughout the system, of course. It, it took many years for that ideology to spread, but you begin to see uh, kind of a growth in that ideology in the 1990s, really, as, as a lot of new ideas, and then you see it really a lot today. So one of the things that I've been wanting to do is just encourage people to look at the opportunity for education freedom. In reality, I, I don't believe that we should shut down the public education system. I think what we need is the opportunity to empower parents to send children to the public education uh, or to the educational uh, background of their choice. So I think that's going to be very, very important. And sadly, Wyoming is in a very devastated place. Uh, we are, according to the Center for Education Reform for their Parent Power Index, we are 47th in the nation. When you look at uh, the Heritage Foundation, they have a comprehensive study. They study a lot of different things, but as you drill down into the numbers, we're 44th on their index for education freedom. And most people, when they think of Wyoming, they don't think of us being uh, such a, a closed system, as it were. But Wyoming is in a very difficult place, and that's the reason why I've devoted a lot of my life to trying to free students and free parents to find the educational opportunity that best suits their children's needs. And that's one of the big efforts of Wyoming Family Alliance. So that's obviously a lot of information. Let's talk right now, if we can, about school choice in Wyoming. What's the status? Well, right now we have um, private school academic performance, as we've seen, has been superior to public schools across the nation. And I there there's a number of places that I could cite for things like that. And what we do know from a recent study is a majority of parents would prefer that their children would be educated, and this is in Wyoming, would be educated somewhere other than a public school. But what we have done, we have a research assistant on our staff here that has found that over 90% of students in the uh, uh, state of Wyoming do not live within 30 miles of a place where they could actually send a child, and uh, or at least that has the capacity to hold them. And that's because our studies have shown that we have less than 40 uh, uh, private schools. And it's just been a very difficult position to try to start children in any sort of uh, uh, private school. There's, it's, difficult, we're difficult, it's difficult to find a private school. And it's partly because 
of the just the financial cost it takes to build one up and how much money is being spent in the public education system. So there's a lot of work to be done there. And so in respect to legislation and school choice in the state of, of Wyoming, where do things stand when, in respect to public schools? Well, I think this is interesting. You know, I, I mentioned that parent power index and uh, the, how we're currently 47. Mm -hmm. About four years ago, Wyoming was 50th in, in that index. And we finally were able to pass a very, very limited uh, charter school uh, piece of legislation that narrowly opened the window and it bumped us up a few points. And that's wonderful. But uh, that's just for charter schools. Uh, really what we need, charter schools can help a, in, a, in a larger city where there's a, a lot of students. But what we really need is a comprehensive look at education savings accounts. And that's one of the things I've been uh, working on uh, with a group of people for some time, uh, very passionate about it. And we had legislation last year uh, that made it through the Senate, but it was sadly not out, allowed out of the speaker's desk last year. Now, this year there is a new effort, and uh, some of that did start with the uh, with the current uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, there's a couple things in there I think that are very problematic, but if they can be removed, I think that this current education savings account legislation has some potential. And so it's going to take some time. I think I'm not sure how far it'll go this year. We're heading into a budget session and it takes a two thirds supermajority to move legislation forward during a budget year. It's, so what would you like to see removed that's currently in the legislation? There are two things that they've baked in. First, they and there are a few other things for sure that I would tweak, but one of them, they have built a kind of a means testing. Uh, so right now it stands where uh, a person can only receive this if they go up to 250% of the federal poverty level. Now, mind you, there, everyone that is going to be trying to get money to help educate their children are paying in money into the system right now through property taxes. And so to take from people and then not give them, give at least some funding back, I think is a fundamental unfairness. And uh, in many states that have education savings account legislation, they've seen that and they've begun pulling those things back. Secondly, this legislation ties uh, together with uh, a new idea. I think it's kind of novel. I don't know that it's happened in other states like this. They're trying to also get early childhood uh, education in the same bill as an education savings account. And I think that those two things don't mix. And that's the reason why you don't see that in almost any other state where that is has begun. So that would be starting up an all new program. We already have early childhood education programs out there. So to start up an all new one on the back of this legislation, I think would be detrimental to, to the effort. And as we know, and as you said, the, the last measure got through the Senate, didn't get passed or didn't get out of the speaker's desk. Do we have any idea if the speaker is willing to pull the next measure out of his desk? And what do you think the chances of getting the supermajority that's going to be needed during the next session are? Well, you know, um, I've been appreciative uh, of the fact that he actually brought this legislation, this current education savings account legislation. Um, I, I do think that there are some problems in there that need to be resolved, but I've been thankful at least to see some movement on this issue. And so I think if we give uh, people the opportunity to come together around a consensus as to how to best pro provide education for the future of, of Wyoming, we may see something. I, I always hold out hope. I hope to be one of those eternal optimists like Ronald Reagan was. You know, I believe that people can aim uh, for what is good. And and so we'll see if, if that'll come about. But uh, I think it has a chance, but we'll just have to see, um, you know, if we can get that amended. Because if we can't, I do know that there are some other uh, 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 groups of people, uh, myself included, that would find a, a lot of problems in the, in the uh, current legislation. Let's change gears if we can for a second and just briefly touch on parental rights in the state of Wyoming. What's the status right now, in your opinion, and where would you like to see it go? Parental rights in general, I think, has come a long way since I was in the legislature. I was vice chair of judiciary and House Republican caucus chair at the time. And I was very thankful for some, some work that was done 
uh, about five or six years ago that really has moved the ball forward uh, in a major way. But one of the places where parental rights uh, really needs to be shored up is in this realm of education. Uh, right now, if, if you were told, hey, you can feed your child anything they want, as long as it's from McDonald's, it's really not a choice. And so parental rights really, I think, uh, where it's suffering the most is in giving parents the opportunity to send the child, their children, uh, to a school that best suits their child's needs. Uh, I think that's where we need a lot of work to happen and very rapidly in Wyoming. All right, I think we've covered what I wanted to cover for today, but I'd like to touch on something real quickly. Tell me what you like most about living in the state of Wyoming. I know there's lots of great answers out there, but what's yours? I, I have to tell you in a story, if it's okay. Please. We moved here when I was a very young teenager. I was 13 uh, from the state of Arkansas. And I remember as you used to drive along the, the highways in Arkansas, trees just soared up all around you. It was amazing, you know, and I just took that for granted. Then we moved out here to the state of Wyoming, and I had read every Louis L'Amour book I could get my hands on. I was, I had read them all by the age of uh, 13. I had this very romanticized view of Wyoming. We moved out here, and I began to understand big sky country. And so I used to crawl up on the roof of our house out at Terry Bison Ranch Road at night, and I would uh, get my dad's binoculars. It's the best I had. And I would stare at the night sky for hours on end. And it just absolutely blew my mind how beautiful the sky looked, both in the daytime, but especially at night. I have a love affair with the, uh, with the way the night sky looks. And I remember when we went back to Arkansas to visit relatives, I felt claustrophobic. We're driving down those same roads and all those trees now felt like it, they were closing me in. And so I, I figured out very quickly as a young man that I love the open spaces of Wyoming and the big skies. Great answer. Great answer. Yeah, and I've lived out in the Mountain West many times, and I cannot tell you, I agree with you 100%. Now, for people that want to find out more about the Wyoming Family Alliance, where can they go? You can go to wyomingfamily.org, wyomingfamily.org. Fantastic. Nathan, thank you so much for your time. We're going to talk again, I'm sure, multiple times. Great information. If people want to find out more about this, they can go to whyliberty.org, wyliberty.org. Sign up for our newsletter. And Nathan, thanks again for your time tonight. This is a real joy. Thank you so much, Michael. You bet.